Well, greetings, everyone, and welcome to the EKG case for the week of April 1st, 2013. We've got a great case for you, and this week's case was sent to us all the way from Chile by Dr. Nicholas Pineda. Uh, and by the way, as long as we're talking about Chile, I want to let you know about a fantastic conference that's coming up August 28th through 30th in Santiago, Chile. And some of the speakers are the likes of Dr. Mel Herbert, Stuart Swadron, Billy Mallon, and a handful of other really excellent speakers. It's going to be a fantastic conference. And I don't know what the website is, but if I can find that out for you, I'll be happy to share it with anyone. Just email me, and uh, I'm looking forward to attending that conference as well. But anyway, uh, back to the EKG case that Dr. Pineda has sent us. He had a 58-year-old man who had presented to the emergency department complaining of chest pain for about an hour and a half. And one of the things that you'll notice right up front is that there is a left bundle branch block pattern. And what does that mean? Well, when somebody's got chest pain in a left bundle, we've all learned that you can't read any ischemia in the presence of a left bundle. Well, if you've been keeping up with the literature, unlike perhaps some of your consultants, no names to be mentioned, uh, well, you know that you can actually, in many cases, read ischemia in the presence of a left bundle. Not always, but in some cases you can. So that's what we're going to spend time talking about. Before we get into that, we first of all have to define a left bundle. So a left bundle branch block pattern, what are the criteria for a left bundle? First of all, you have to have a wide QRS. It's got to be at least 120 milliseconds. All right, lead V6 typically has these rabbit ear pattern. You see an RS, R prime type of pattern, maybe often present in V5 as well. And typically in lead V1, you've got a little R deep wide S wave. Sometimes you just have this QS type of pattern in V1, and that usually persists out in V2 and V3. Another important finding that you should use to define a left bundle is, you know, a left bundle is such a powerful leftward force, you really should not have any Q waves in those lateral leads. You should just have big R waves, maybe an RS wave, but certainly a big giant R wave without any Q waves in the lateral leads. If you ever see a small Q wave, even a tiny Q wave in those lateral leads, a lot of authors will tell you that that obviates the diagnosis of a left bundle and you have to call it just a non-specific conduction delay. One of the other important findings of a left bundle that relates to ischemia is this thing that we refer to as the rule of appropriate discordance. What that means is that every time the QRS complex primarily goes up, the J point and ST segment should be below the baseline. All right. Actually, I didn't draw that too well. Let me try that again. QRS goes up and the J point should be below the baseline. Well, that almost looks like dig toxicity. But anyway, you get the point. So QRS, for example, in lead one, take a look at lead V1, or rather lead one, the QRS goes up, and so the J point and ST segment are a little bit below the baseline. That's normal. Isoelectric's okay also, but it should be in the opposite direction, discordant. Every time the QRS complex goes down, for example, in lead AVR, the J point or ST segment should be a little bit elevated. Isoelectric is okay, but it should be in the opposite direction once again. And that applies for all 12 leads. <clears throat> all right. If you lose that discordant relationship, you have to worry that the person may be having some ischemia. In other words, if the QRS goes up and the ST segment's also elevated or concordant, same direction, <clears throat> or if the QRS goes down and the ST segment is depressed in the same direction or concordant in the same direction. Well, these findings were all first described back in 1996 by a cardiologist by the name of Elena Scarbosa, and we now refer to this as the Scarbosa criteria. What she described was a very, very nice predictive model for predicting when a person with a left bundle is having an acute MI, essentially a STEMI equivalent. What she said, and I'll refer to these as Scarbosa A, B, and C. Scarbosa criteria A essentially said if the QRS goes up and there's ST segment in the same direction or concordant in the same direction, persons having an MI, Scarbosa criteria B really just applied to V1, V2, or V3. What she said if the QRS complex goes down and the ST segment is depressed in the same direction, 
concordant depression, then that predicts an acute MI. And then Scarbosa criteria C essentially said that if the QRS goes down and there's elevation, normally elevation is okay, but if there is excessive elevation of more than five millimeters, all right, so in other words, this elevation right there is more than five millimeters. If you see more than five millimeters of ST elevation there, then that was predictive of an MI. Unfortunately, that had lower specificity, so we oftentimes don't use that. But Scarbosa criteria A, concordant ST elevation. Scarbosa criteria B, concordant ST depression in V1, V2, or V3. These have more than 90% predictive value for telling you this person is having an MI. And if you have consultants that don't believe you, just show them this article. Oftentimes, a cardiologist may not be up with this, even though you would think so. A lot of them don't know about this or don't believe in it. Show them their literature. Make them read their own stuff. This is the Journal of the American College of Cardiology. This is the most recent really nice review on this topic. I think you should have this in your back pocket and stuff a copy of this into the lab coat of anybody out there who doesn't believe that the Scarbosa criteria are useful. It's a really great review article by the cardiologist for the cardiologist in their main journal. All right, so just show it to them. You've got to know Scarbosa criteria. It's on the EM boards. It's on the cardiology boards. You've got to know about this. And when you see Scarbosa A or B, you've got to act on it. Let's go back to Dr. Pineda's case. 58-year-old man with chest pain. Scarbosa criteria A is present in a handful of leads. Remember Scarbosa criteria A said if the QRS goes up and the J point and ST are in the same direction, <clears throat> and you see this in lead 1 and in lead AVL, and in lead V5, in three leads. By the way, they do not need to be contiguous. This works even if you see it in one isolated lead. In this case, you see it in three leads. QRS complexes are going north, and the J point and ST segment are in the same direction, in lead one, in lead AVL, and they're in lead V5. This person's having an MI. There is no Scarbosa criteria B. You recall Scarbosa criteria B would have said that in leads V1, V2, or V3, if the QRS complex is going down and there is ST, concordant ST segment depression, you'd have to worry about that, and you do not see that in V1, V2, or V3. By the way, you notice that there is concordant ST segment depression in leads 3 and AVF. Some people will probably be looking at that and saying, well, there's concordant ST depression. The QRS is going down, and the J point and ST segment are below the baseline in the same direction. Doesn't that constitute an acute MI also? Well, what I would say is that it constitutes a significant concern, but recall, recall that Scarbosa only talked about concordant ST depression in V1, V2, or V3. She didn't really talk about it in those other leads, and so those don't technically constitute uh, an acute MI, but I would certainly worry quite a bit about it. And no surprise to anybody who actually keeps up with the literature and knows about this, this patient went to the cath lab and had a 100% LAD occlusion. If somebody had simply looked at this 12 lead and said, oh, it's a left bundle, we can't tell anything, this person could very well have died. But fortunately, Dr. Pineda looked at the 12 lead. He knew Scarbosa criteria. He saved a life. Good job. All right, so just to uh, finish things up, please remember again, people still talk about this myth. Acute MI uh, in the presence of a left bundle can sometimes be diagnosed. Not always, but sometimes you can diagnose it based on the Scarbosa A or B. And remember what Scarbosa criteria A is, concordant ST segment depression, or I'm sorry, concordant ST segment elevation. Scarbosa criteria B is that concordant ST segment depression, all right? So when you see concordant ST segments in QRS complexes, you've got to worry about that patient, even though they have a left bundle branch block pattern. And for those people out there that have not typically believed that you can diagnose ischemia or STEMI equivalent in the presence of a left bundle, what you do is tell them to go read a little bit. All right. So uh, again, hope that was helpful. My thanks to Dr. Pineda for sending a fantastic case. And for those people that want a little bit more practice with this concept of Scarbosa criteria, 
We've done this in the EKG video series a couple of times now. Last time we did it was July 23rd, 2012. So just go to the EKG website. And again, it's www.ekg.umem.org. And uh, scroll back to July 23rd. You get some more practice. And I hope that's helpful. Remember, reading EKGs can save lives. So get good at it. And I look forward to talking to all of you next week. Dr. Pineda, thanks for sending a great case.